Hello everyone and welcome to my video about developing a code to control a line follower robot, more especially the line follower robot which I featured in my last video. If you haven't seen that yet, I recommend watching it now, I'll put the link of the video in the description. So in my last video about this robot, I talked about how it is designed, the pit control systems, which is an algorithm which helps the robot to navigate around a black track on a white surface, how it is designed, stuff like that. In this video, I'll explain the code from zero, that even a beginner can understand it. So what you see right now here is the my blog about the line follow robot, which I also included the link in my last videos about line followers. So basically here are the full instructions provided about designing and constructing a line follower robot. I've talked about the 3D designs, the CAD. I also talked a little about the sensors I used. And the last thing, I also included schematics, which we'll use in today's video. Let me just get the schematic here. So basically, to develop a code in Arduino, you always need to keep track of the hardware you are using. Right now, in this project, we are, we are using an Arduino Pro Mini, which we'll use to program with, a motor driver, a Bluetooth module, which will not be included in today's video, and the sensor array. This circuit schematic is important because it keeps track of the pins that are used by the Arduino. For example, the motor driver uses like five pins, the sensor array uses like nine pins. And in order to achieve the desired result, you need to program those pins to emit or receive digital or analog inputs slash outputs. If you program those correctly, you will achieve your desired result. That is the robot, should follow a black line on a white surface. So let's open the uh, program in Arduino. Here we have a blank Arduino program with just two functions, setup and loop. So first I will explain what these functions do. And next we'll take every component in part and we'll try to program those, program the pins, declare the variables that they use and so on. So the Arduino, uh, makes use of these two functions, the setup function and the loop function. Basically, uh, every programming language is sequential. That means for it will execute each line from top to bottom. In the setup function, you put, you declare pins, declare variables, things that you only want to execute once. For example, if you put Imagine that we put here a declaration of a, a variable, step one. After the setup phase, we go into the loop phase where we design the algorithm we want to use. In the loop function, the code will execute for an infinite time. And it will execute, as I said, because this is sequential, it will execute from top to bottom. And when it reaches the bottom, it will go back to the top. For example, step two and step three. Let's say there are some functions, I don't know, some operations. Then when we run this code on a robot, it will execute first the step one, then step two, step three, and then again, step two and step three for an infinite time. Besides these two functions, you can also declare variables outside them. For example, at the start of the program, you can declare of a variable a to take a five. Then it will execute first this and then the setup and then we'll take the loop. These variables that are declared outside the functions are called global variables. And basically, if you mention the variable here in the setup or in the loop, uh, they will know that we are talking about this variable and not something else. Okay, so now we'll take step by step every hardware that we, we are using in this project. We'll try to declare all the pins, all the usages, try to develop functions in order to have the functionality of that hardware implemented. And we'll first start with the motor driver, 
if you go back to the project and scroll to the list of the hardware, we have here the DRV8835 dual motor driver carrier. And if we press buy, it should forward us to the Polulu website, where you have here, we have all the documentation you need for the motor driver. What we need is the usage of the motor driver, where it shows how you can wire it with the microcontroller and with the motors, and of course with the battery, and also how, the, how you can control, how you can develop the code in order to control the motors, the speed and the direction of the motor. As you can see, the motor driver is connected with the microcontroller by five GPO pins and of course the VCCN ground. These five GPO pins we'll use to declare them in our Arduino code. So let's do that right now. We have the A phase, the A enable, the B phase, and B enable. And of course, mode. So what we have right now here are some global variables of the motor driver that need to be initialized with the corresponding pin. In order to do that, let's take a look on the circuit schematic. As we can see here, each of these pins are connected to the Arduino. For example, B12 or B enable is connected to the digital pin of the Arduino with number three. So let's write it down here. All right, uh, B1, B11. Let's move on to B phase, which in the circuit schematic is B in one, is connected to the Arduino digital pin with number five. A enable is uh, the digital pin six and A phase should be the digital pin nine and mode is to the digital pin eight. You can also check that. I think I have a different circuit schematic. Yeah, write this and I've written the di digital pins, the corresponding numbers, mode is eight, A in one is nine, six, five, three. I think we got it correctly. So now we know that the motor driver is connected to the Arduino by these pins. But the Arduino doesn't know yet what these pins do. We just declare some numbers here with their corresponding variable name. So in the setup phrase, we can declare what the pin should do. And we declare that with a function pin mode. Pin mode can be either, we can set the pin to either to be an input, that means the Arduino expects to read a value, a digital or an analog value, or the pin can also be an output, where the Arduino sends a digital or analog value. In this case, we want our pins to be outputs, but we also need to declare what pins we are talking about, F phase output. And this will go for all of, all of other pins, for the others. A phase, A enable, B phase, B enable, and mode. And we've seen here in the motor driver documentation, we'll use this type of movement and mode will be all, always set on high. So we can declare it right now by digital output or no, digital write we write a digital to the corresponding pin, we want mode to always be high. So we will not, we'll never change mode, the digital write of the mode ever again. I've mentioned that we set our pins on output, for example, we can either send a digital output or an analog output. The difference between these two is that the digital can either send a low value, zero, or a high value, one. The analog value that can be sent uh, can take a value between low or high. And this value is an integer that can be between zero, which is the low value, 
and 255, the high value. So basically, the digital output can either send low or high, whereas the analog value can be between these two thresholds. In order to have the motor driver fully implemented into our code, we, we need to declare a function that controls the movement and the direction of our motors. We'll declare our function below the loop one as a void function. Uh, basically, the first uh, parameter that uh, the function takes uh, represents the return value of the given function. For example, if I would declare a function with an int, we expect that this function at the final stage will return an integer. But we don't want to return anything, so it will be just a void. We don't expect to return anything. We just want to control our motors. So our function will take two arguments as input, which will be the speed of the first motor, speed a, and the speed of the second motor. So basically, when we are going to call this function, we, ju we want to mention the speed of the motors. In order to develop our code to control our motors, we, we need to take a look at our motor driver documentation right here. So basically, uh, this table tells us how we can control our motors. If the phase is set to zero and the enable is set to a value between zero and 255, the motors will spin forward at the speed of that value, in, but in the percentage. So basically that value will convert between the thresholds of zero and 255 to a value between zero and 100. So basically if our PWM value is 255, like the high one, the motor will spin at 100%. If it is at half of 0 and 255, it will spin at 50%. The same thing goes for phase when it's set to 1, to a high value. Um, it will be the same thing, but the motor will turn backwards, in reverse. And it doesn't matter what the phase is set to, it can be low or high. If the enable is set to zero, the motor will drive at 0% or as we can say, it won't turn. So keeping that in mind, let's go back to our code to implement this functionality. So if we want our robot to turn forward, we want to set the phase of each motor to a low value. So we can say digital, write f phase because f phase is a global variable uh, the function will know which f phase we are talking about f phase will set to low and then we want to turn that uh, motor to a given speed and that given speed is mentioned here so analog write this time we are writing an analog value to our a enable and we'll give the speed a value and the same goes for the second motor b phase is set to low b enable takes the speed b argument specified at the beginning of the program and we will rename this to forward movement. But what if we also want our robot to go backwards? For example, if we have a very narrow curve, we want one motor to go backwards, one motor to go forward. And with this movement, the motor can spin around itself. We can make another function or we can say, taking into consideration that these values, speed A and speed B, can be negative. And when they will be negative, we know that we want to go backwards and not forward. And in order to develop this, we will make some conditions. If speed A is lower than zero, we want our robot to go backwards. Uh, 
uh, the motor, the specify motor we want to go backwards. Else, if speed a is higher than zero, then you want to go forward, and this is, needs to be set on high. The same thing goes for the second motor. And because we are working with both a negative and a positive value, when we write an analog signal, we need to have that value converted to between an interval 0 to 255. So if the value is negative in this condition, we will also say that it should be positive. And that converts our value into a positive value. And the robot will turn at a specified percentage. And we will delete this digital write. Good. And like that, we are now done with the implementation of our motor driver and the functionalities of the motors. Let's move on to our second piece of hardware, that being the sensor array. Fortunately, uh, the Polulu put us a library available for us to use. If you click on Tools and go to Manage Libraries, this will take some seconds. Any time now. And if we search for QTR sensor, You can install this QTR sensors library by Pololu, version 4.0.0. I already have it installed. After you install it, you can access some of the codes offered by this library in the file examples QTR sensors. And let's open QTR RC example. So basically, in this example code, you can see how they implemented the QTR sensors to work with the Arduino. Here we have the global variables that specify how many ER sensors we have. Here in this array, we'll store our sensor values each time we declare a function that reads from the surface in order to try to get the position of the line. Here we set our QTR sensor to type RC, we set the pins that the QTR sensor is connected to, to the Arduino. We can also calibrate our sensor in order to have accurate and more reliable readings with the surface the robot is on. And in the loop function, every 250 seconds, there is a call to the QTR read line black that uh, reads um, position of a black line on a white surface and then prints the position of the line as well as the values of each sensor. This might seem much but when we'll take each of this line and put it in our code, you'll, I'm sure we'll understand better this implementation and the library. So first, let's declare that we will use the library into our code include QTR sensors dot h and then de let's declare the global variables that we'll use. We'll first um, declare a QTR object sensor. We'll use this to basically have access to the functions this library provides and then we'll mention the number of the sensor we have on the sensor array. We have right now we have eight and then we'll use this array to store each the values of the sensors each time we call a read function. Good. Now we need to declare the pins for our sensor array. And you have the list also in the project of the robot. We can see that the LED on is connected to pin 7. This is the set emitter pin. We'll use the, this pin in order to calibrate the sensor array. And the other pins are connected to pins 10, 11, 12, 
and then a0, a1, a2, a4, a5. Starting with 10, 11, 12, a0, a1, a2, a4, and a5. And I realized that I changed the example code and not our code. Oops. All right, now that's better. So after we are done with the setup phase of our code, we want to calibrate the sensor array at the end of the, this function in order to have reliable and accurate readings of the sensor array. In order to do that, we'll simply just copy this loop that will execute for 400 times and the calibration will take about 10 seconds. So basically, let's write here 10 seconds. So basically, during this calibration phase, you want to move your robot across the black uh, line, across the track. So each of these sensors will take values from the white surface and the black line. That will be considered as a successful calibration. At the end of this video, I'll show how, how exactly you can calibrate your robot and how to do it properly. There is one more thing we need to do first after we go to developing the PID control system. We have in the circuit schematic two buttons. One button is to, for calibration and one button is for starting and turning off the robot. Let's implement both of these buttons as well. So we have a button for the calibration. which is connected to A3 of the Arduino. And we have one button for start, which is connected to pin 2 of the Arduino. So if you take a look at the circuit schematic, you can see the implementation of the buttons uh, that are connected to the ground, and to the 5 volts of the Arduino Pro Mini. When the button is not pushed, the Arduino will receive a low value. Nothing is going on, the circuit is open. When the button is pushed, the circuit will be closed, the current will flow through the button and through this wire that is connected to the input of the Arduino. So when the button is pressed, the Arduino will receive a high digital value. Taking that into consideration, then our buttons, the pins, will be declared as inputs. Pin mode button calibration will be an input. And the same goes for the start button. So let's put our calibration button into use. Right now, when the program of the robot starts, it will first declare all these global variables, then declare the pins, set up the pins, and then goes directly to calibrate the robot. We don't want that. We want to wait for the user to press the calibration button, and then the robot will, will calibrate. In order to do that, we can stack the program into a loop right before the calibration process. For example, if we declare a loop while, um, while we read this calibration button and it is a low value, so digital read of the button is low, then we want to be stuck in this loop. When the user press, presses the button, we'll move on to the calibration and then to the main loop. We can do the same with the start button. After we are done with the calibration, we can make a loop that makes the program stuck whenever the start button is not pressed. When the user will press the start button, the program will go directly to the main loop and execute the PID control system, which will be the next stage of our code development. But first, let's compile our code until this stage to see if we have any errors. 
I enable was not declared in this scope. Why? Because I've typed it wrong. Okay. And yep, yeah, it compiles. Now let's move on to our PID control system. If you want to look about the PID control systems, the algorithm and how it is implemented uh, at a theoretical level, I recommend watching my latest video about line followers robots where I explain in detail the implementation and how the PID control systems works. Right now I'll just copy what I've said in the last latest video and put it into code. So let's get started. To begin with, we want to declare another function we'll, where we'll do the implementation of the PID control system. It is easier for us to implement later in the loop main loop and also to read the code more properly. So let's implement a PID control function which doesn't return anything and doesn't take any arguments. And we'll start by reading the position the current position of the line. We can do that with an unsigned integer position line and we'll call the QTR from the QTR sensors, the global variable we have declared here and we'll access a function from the library read line black. You can see that it turned into a different color, into red, so we know that this function is correct. Also, this function will take as argument our array of sensor values, so basically it will change our array with the latest readings of each sensor, and we can access those later. To explain how the position of the line is calculated is based on a mathematical equation. So the position is equal to the first reading of the sensor array, so the first is 0, multiplied by 0 plus the second sensor value multiplied with 1000 plus the, second, uh, the third sensor value multiplied by 2000 and so on. So we take each sensor in part and multiply it with the next 1000 with an addition of 1000 and so on to the last sensor value. This would be 7 multiplied by 700, uh, 7000 and all of this All of this is divided by the addition of each sensor value. Sensor value 1 plus sensor value 2 plus the last sensor value. And basically this position will take values between 0 and 7000. And depending on the last digit of the number, for example, we, if we have the position of the line equal to 2000, we will know that the position of the line is below the third sensor, sensor value 2, which is the third sensor. With the position is 0, we know that is below sensor, the first sensor, sensor value 0. And the middle, like the ideal value that we want our track to be relative to our sensor array, is 3500, which is exactly between sensor 4th and sensor 5th. which are sensor value 3 and sensor value 4 between them, between sensors 4 and 5. 
So the PID control system functions based on an error. And this error will be the difference between the ideal position of the line, which in this case will be 3500, and the current position of the line. Okay, so now that we have our error, we'll know that when the error is near zero or even zero, there is no need for correction. The line, the track is below at the middle of the sensor array, the robot goes just fine. If the error is below zero, that means the position, the current position of the line is higher than the ideal value. So that means the position of the line is near the end of the eighth to the right of the sensor array. Near to the sensor value seven. If the error is higher than zero, then the position of the line is smaller than the ideal value, and that means it's to the left of the sensor array, the line, near to the sensor value zero. Let's now implement the three control terms from the PID control system. First, we have the proportional term, which is equal to the error. Then, we have the integral term, which is equal to the error plus itself. And then, the last one is the derivative control term, which is equal to the last error from the last loop minus the current error. And now we can assign the last error to be the current error because we won't use it anymore, but in the next loop for the new derivative term. And we also need to initialize and declare this as a global variable, int last error equal to zero. So each of these control terms can be implemented to represent the change that the motor speed needs to take. For example, if the line of the track goes to the left or to the right of the robot, of the sensor array, then these control terms will interact with the motors in order to put the robot on the right track. So we will combine all of this into a single value, which will be the motor speed that the, robot, that the motors need to change by change, which is equal to the proportional term multiply by a constant, I'll talk later about them, plus the integrate term multiplied by its constant, plus the der derivative term multiplied by its constant. If you would implement the, the motor speed change only with the proportional integrate and derivative terms, this could take a higher values, a, like thousands. And we want these constants to make this motor speed change a value between 0 and 255, something like that, to control the motors, but to also have some impact on them, but not that huge of an impact. So this is why we implement these constants. Uh, if you want more info about these constants, I, I am talking about them in my latest video, of course. So let's declare them as global variables. This constant needs to be declared by the user. If they are set on zero, the robot will just go straight forward. So for my robot, I have set them on the proportional constant is 0 0.07. This is on zero, I don't usually use that. And this is on 0 0.7. There is one more thing we need to implement here is and is the connection between this speed control and the motors. So we can set two new motor speeds. One is for the first motor, one is for the second motor. Motor speed A, which will be the base speed value. 
this base speed value is basically the speed that your robot wants to take when it will go straight forward. We won't, don't want to take the... It depends on the robot and depends on the track. If there are a lot of uh, straight lines, you can increase that to the maximum value. Also, this takes between 0 and 255. I will say that this should take 150 for now. And in addition, we'll implement, we'll put the motor speed change. The same goes for the motor speed B, but with minus. So basically, when there is no error, the motor speed change will be zero. So the motor speed A and B will be set to 150. When the error is positive and there is an error, the motor speed A will increase and the motor speed B will decrease so that the robot can take a curve. Depending on how high is the error and the constants, this curve can be narrow or wider. If the error is negative, the motor speed change will also be negative, so the motor speed A will decrease and the motor speed B will increase. So basically, this right here tells the robot to go left or right. We also want to add some conditions like what if the motor speed A is not between 0 and 255, right? We can set some conditions if the motor speed A is higher than 255. Let's make it the maximum value, 255. The same goes for motor speed B. And of course, we'll also say with 0. 0, 0. But wait, we've implemented that our motors can take negative values. So we can say that the motor can turn backwards when it is below zero. So actually, we can also say here that is. So basically, it can take between minus 255 and 255. And when it's negative, the motor will turn backwards. We don't want this value to be very high because it will damage the motors and it might spin very fast. So we can say here that we don't want to be below minus 75. That seems reasonable. And after all of these conditions, we can simply call that the robot needs to take the motor speed for motor A and the motor speed for motor B. That is all of this code. That's basically all of the PID control system that needs to be implemented in order to have a line follower robot functional. So let's compile it to see if there are any more errors and there are not. So let's upload the code to the Arduino and see how the robot will go. Okay, so I've uploaded the code to Arduino and now let's run it. I already turned on the robot. We just need to press the calibration button in order to get the robot calibrated. I press it and now for 10 seconds I'll move the robot, the sensor array, across the whole surface, the black line and the white surface, so the sensors can calibrate with all of the readings. Okay, I think that's enough. Now let's run it. This is the start button. And it doesn't do anything. This might be because I inverted the start button with the calibration button. And now that I press the start button, it will actually calibrate. So let's try that to see if this is the case. I'll calibrate it again. And now I'll press the calibrate button. Doesn't work. Let's see why. Okay, so I see now that in the main loop, the loop that actually executes the code and all the functions we want to execute, we didn't put anything. So let's put our pit control function and now it should work. It doesn't matter if the calibration button and the start button are reverted, we'll live with that. Okay, so take two on the robot. Let's now calibrate. I'll 
try to press both of the buttons to calibrate it. I don't know which is the calibration button. I press them. Now for 10 seconds I will move the robot across the line. That should be enough. And now let's run the code. Okay, that's not how it is supposed to come here. Okay, so the... Okay, one of the motors is turning backwards instead of forward. So, I think the wiring might be wrong. Let's try to change that in, into our code. I've noticed that here is a very, uh, not a very great mistake, but it's a mistake. Like the motor speed, when the motor speed is higher than minus 75, I mean like all of the times, it should always go backwards. And that's not what we want. Now, I'm not even sure if the cause with the inverted motors was the problem. Maybe it was, let's keep it that way. But mistakes like that can happen. I also want to decrease this to 2000, uh, 200. So what I was trying to say, mistakes like this can happen. Don't worry, just analyze the code, see what's not good. You can even print the values, like you can serial that print, you can look at the documentation of serial to see how you can print values to your PC from the line follower. You can print your values to see what's going on with your robot. And like that, you can debug your code if something doesn't work. So let's try again to test our robot. Also, let's type here 200 and that should be all. Let's upload the code. Okay, now let's see. Oh, one of these buttons should work. Huh, and now the robot goes completely backwards. Okay, nice. I need to inverse the <laughs> speed, <laughs> the movement. I know exactly what it is is the constant. When we declare the constants with 0 0.07, we declare as them as integers. Integers are number without decimals. So that means this constants will always be zero. So let's declare them to float type so they can be properly be implemented into the pit control system and I'm sure that this will be the last test that we are doing on the robot. Actually, from the previous tests, the speed of the motors were actually kind of high, even that, even that the robot didn't actually work. So let's decrease these values, like the base speed value should be 75. Let's just decrease them a little, 125. And this is, this is okay. And let's try with these values to see how it goes. Okay, I don't know what test number we are actually on, so I'm just going to calibrate the robot. And then it should work. Like if this test doesn't work, I'm out of ideas what is wrong. Oh, and yeah, it works now. It's a little wiggling because the constant terms aren't set up correctly. It can be increased or decreased. We'll see. But the main point is that we have now a functional line follower robot. I'm actually going to change the constant terms a little. I think the derivative and the proportional terms needs to be increased. And we'll do a last test. Okay, so I said that I want to increase, I, so it's wiggling, so I need to change the proportional term. Let's put z that 0 0.8 and let's increase this to that 0.9. And actually, let's also say this like that. Actually, let's put it to 9 
and now it shouldn't wiggle, wiggle anymore. And let's see if now the robot is wiggling more or less. Okay, that's enough. Ah, start. Okay, it's the second button. It's not, so what's going on? Ah. Actually, they might be decreased. I need to decrease the values, not increase them. Okay, so another problem that made the robot wiggling was the derivative term, this one. This is actually should be inverted. So in this situation, when pr practically, practically the derivative term says that when there is a sudden change of the position of the line, the robot should take immediate left or right, depending on the track. But in this case, it was the inverse. When the track went to the right of the sensor array, the robot would actually take the left. So if your robot is wiggling and doesn't work properly for some reason, you might take into consideration the derivative term as well as the error. This can also be inverted. In this case, it, it is the good position, the good uh, mathematical calculation, but take into consideration that. I've also ch adjusted a little on these terms. I will actually add um, zero, that zero 0.7 to the proportional term, and this should take care of everything. Okay, so this is the last test, hopefully. We've changed the derivative term, we've in inverted the difference between the last error and the current error. So now it should be fixed. We've also changed a little of the constants of the all control terms. So now the robot should run perfectly. I also put the code in the description of the video. I'll not put it on the Hexter page. So if you want to get it, you just you can just look in the description of the video. So let's test it. Okay, now it runs without wiggling, without any problems at all. And actually with a higher speed. So that I think that's all for today. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye-bye.